Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for attending. I am Elizabeth Mansfield. I am from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. And it is my privilege to host this meeting on behalf of the National Nanotechnology Initiative. The NNI is a US government R&D initiative consisting of over 20 federal agencies and departments who work together to achieve the shared vision of a future in which the ability to understand and control matter in the nanoscale leads to ongoing revolutions in technology and industry that benefit society. Today's meeting, as well as the complete webinar series was organized by the NNI, uh, sorry, by the National ne Nanotechnology Coordination Office, the NNCO, along with leaders from a number of agents, NNI agencies and departments. The NNCO is the coordinating arm of the NNI and facilitates activities covering eight, areas of shared interest that cross-cut the R&D portfolios of the NNI's federal agencies and departments. Some housekeeping as we get started. The meeting will be recorded and posted later online. Please use the question and answer chat to ask questions, and questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar in the Q&A session. And just a special thank you to Matt, Matthew Knorr for coordinating these webinars. This year, the NNI is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 21st Century Nanotechnology Research and Development Act. I would like to invite you to attend the corresponding symposium entitled Enabling the Nanotechnology Revolution on March 5th, 2024. This slide has a QR code where you can register, as well as some of the featured speakers in this symposium. There are quite a few speakers for this uh, day long event that will be celebrating the 20 years with NNI. So please make sure you tune in. Uh, registration can also be uh, handled at the nano.gov anniversary symposium website. Throughout the year, the NNI and the NNCO will be hosting a metrology webinar series. This public webinar series is designed to inform you of various challenges presented by cross-cutting research in nanotechnology. The series begins with this session, an introduction to nanometrology history and state-of-the-art in philosophy. The next webinar will take place on February 2nd and will focus on nanometrology for food, agriculture, and the environment. Um, you can register for these webinars at nano.gov, nanometrology webinar series. Um, and this uh, next, uh, webinar will cover measurement challenges when addressing concerns related to nano-enabled agriculture and the environmental fate of nanoplastics. The next in the series will be a webinar on the metrology of nanoscale medical and pharmaceutical products. This will take place on March 1st and will address measurement challenges in medicine and pharmaceuticals regarding the manufacture, characterization, and targeting of nano-enabled drug products. Um, the final webinar in the series will take place on April 5th in, on the metrology of nanoparticles and electronics. We hope you are able to tune in for all of them. And again, registration is available on the NNI website at nano.gov nanometrology webinar se seminar series. An introduction to the webinar series um, will begin this, uh, today by setting up a background on nanometrology. We will cover a background in philosophy of nanometrology, review the state of the art of nanometrology, and then doing a, do a more specific dive into a history of a specific area of nanotechnology. We are lucky to have with us today, Dr. Angela Heitwalker. Dr. Heitwalker is a project leader in the quantum measurement division at NIST. Her research focuses on advancing optical spectroscopic techniques as a function of wavelength, polarization, temperature, and magnetic and electric fields to elucidate novel properties of low dimensional quantum nanomaterials. She is a fellow of the APS and is presently the chair of the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics. We also have with us Dr. Andras Vladar. Dr. Vladar is a project leader in the Microsystems and Nanotechnology Division in the Physical Measurement Laboratory. 
His current research interests are computational SEM, developing methods to allow SEM to work in locally ultra clean environment to make atomic level quantitative measurements possible and laser interferometry based sub nanometer accuracy beam positioning, including non raster scanning of the electron beam. And myself, Elizabeth Mansfield, I am a project leader in the Applied Chemicals and Materials Division. My research focuses on electronic materials characterization, specifically low dimensional nano and quantum materials. I am the leader of the Measurement and Characterization Working Group of the US Technical Advisory Group to ISO TC229 on nanotechnologies. We're gonna start with an introduction to metrology. A metrology is the study of measurement, and it is an important part of the research and development toolbox that enables researchers to measure the properties and performance of materials and devices to generate data from laboratory experiments. More specifically today, we will be focusing on nanometrology. Nanometrology is a study of nanoscale measurement and presents a unique set of challenges due to the small size of the materials. And this allows, uh, often requires more sensitive and innovative tools, methods, and techniques to obtain and understand characterization data. Over the past 20 years of nanotech R&D, many areas of research have required the development of novel tools and materials and methods to characterize and evaluate materials, devices, and formulations. All of today's speakers are scientists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, NIST is the nation's metrology institute. As scientists at NIST, we are consistently working towards global harmonization of standards and traceability to the SI unit. We collaborate internationally with other NMIs to support US standards interest. NIST is also part of the Department of Commerce and our role is to support standards to advanced international trade and commerce. Um, as we support and develop standards, uh, we support the development of standard strategies, including the needs for physical reference materials, documentary standards and measurement methods to support the industry. Supporting these standards help American industry compete on a label, level playing field with the rest of the international community. Our agency collaborates with other organizations that create standards and works, um, and many of these work with ANSI, um, the American National Standards Institute. Within the US, developing standards is a process based upon reaching a consensus among interested parties instead of being edicts, it's, issued for the government. So standards organizations rely on industry input to develop relevant and robust standards that support the industry. And there are many standards organizations active in nanometrology efforts. And I've just shown a few of the organizations here in the slide. Metrology requires a lot of attention to a lot of aspects to develop the full picture. These areas include establishing units of measure um, to ensure uniformity across standards, uh, uh, uniformity across systems. Uh, it also requires some new development of measurement methods. This allows us to measure what is the relevant physical chemical properties of nanomaterials. Um, we always want to understand the underlying uncertainty, uncertainty that helps provide the boundaries for where the measurement is effective. And this requires complete error analysis for these measurements. Um, accuracy of the measurement is always important and it allows us to know what the true value of the system is. Um, we focus on ensuring traceability to document and value um, the accuracy of this measurement. And one additional step that has become very important, especially in nanometrology, is the use of uh, validation through interlaboratory comparisons and um, development of robust measurement methods. Now, metrology is really important um, in establishing the, the properties and performance of materials um, and underpinning everything that we build upon this. And so metrology really, I'm sorry, Metrology really is the base layer of confidence that we build our whole system of standards, procedures, and eventually trade on. Um, it 
allows us to understand where we trust the data and supports informed decision making as we move up the pyramid um, into agreement, certifications, um, and products. So nanometrologists over time have had to consider a lot of unique challenges that arise with nanomaterials, including low signals and signal to noise, ra signal to noise ratios due to nanoparticle sizes, um, low Z material and how to detect those, um, sample preparation that may change the material as it is prepared for analysis. Um, just detection limits and normal measurement techniques may not apply for nanomaterials based on their small size. And of course, stability issues with the particles, um, whether or not they are in a pure system or in a complex matrix. Early nanometrology work focused on what was the most pertinent pertinent to measure. So what is it and where was it? Um, physical chemical properties, elemental analysis, size, shape, all of these were very important to measure and often required support of reference materials, both those established at NIST and other na national metrology institutes around the world. Um, at the same time, measurement methods were being established for a variety of analytical techniques to apply those to nanoparticle systems. Um, these standard protocols were often published and validated, um, many through the standards bodies or through um, journal uh, peer-reviewed publications. Sample preparation and analysis protocols can have a significant impact on the material. Um, for example, in the top left corner is a uh, carbon nanotube sample that has been dispersed in a solvent um, that sticks to the outside of the, the nanotube. So when measuring a, a thickness of these, you may not get the true answer because you may be measuring the matrix. Um, understanding and finding nanoparticles in complex matrices is also of growing interest, especially in the area of nanoplastics. In addition, materials are constantly changing. Uh, we are seeing increased purity, and um, higher quality materials hitting the market, as well as developing new types of nanomaterials that allow us to reach goals, say, in the pharmaceutical industry. We're 20 years into this, and we're, there's still plenty of room to grow in nanometrology, and this will continue to be an area of increased interest. And so what's next looking forward? Uh, we would like to understand if our current measurement methods are standing the test of time. This requires validation of our methods um, and really ensuring that we have good metrology practices in place. We'd like to make sure we're developing robust testing and validation methods, even with the most complicated systems. We have to ensure that we are getting the most accurate answers with a, within the bounds of an uncertainty. And finally, we'd like to recognize opportunities for future innovation. There's plenty of room to develop new measurement tools and techniques, um, and we will see uh, these changes uh, go forward as the field of nanometrology continues to change and grow. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to have Angie Heitwalker share some information about the state of the art of nanotechnology. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, let me get back here to sharing. So um, again, thank you all so much for participating and caring about nanometrology because it's something certainly at NIST that we, we think very highly of and um, enjoy working on. 
So um, I just thought I'd back up just a little bit and reiterate some of the, um, the sort of the content that Elizabeth was talking about. So when we think about a metrological approach, whether it's nano uh, specific or not, there's sort of this layered um, process that Elizabeth went through. Um, and I think it's really important to get back to it because the real base of all the work that we do both at NIST and in moving nanometrology forward is measurement science. And typically how we share our measurement science is in peer reviewed publications. And we do that work at NIST definitely jointly with both academicians and, and with industry. And so NIST is a great place if you're interested in this sort of work. But measurement science and really developing the science is a key part to moving towards nanometrology. We can't do it without, again, the, the base um, really solid in the science. And if we feel like our measurement science is, is really stable and it's well understood, we move up our chain and, and we go to perhaps developing documentary standards. And these are just two examples from um, the committee that Elizabeth now leads and I led many years ago. It's the ISO committee TC229, and that's broadly called nanotechnology. And here within the US, ANSI um, leads that work. And I highly suggest if you have any interest in this work that you reach out to ANSI and become a member because it is, there are many benefits. I'd be happy to talk to you offline about participating in it. I will say developing documentary standards is a weird thing. <laughs> it's of course based on measurement science because there has to be good science to support it. But there also has to be a a um, like a scientific, um, how to describe it, uh, a networking that goes on. So you, we, you work with our international partners to move forward documents that are the strongest, hopefully, and then those make it to publication. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about documentary standards in a second. And then if we really understand the behavior and the measurement of a nanomaterial, we can sometimes move up to this thing called physical standards. NIST within the US is um, one institution where you can actually buy the physical standards. Now, I give you two examples here. One is gold nanoparticles and the other is single walled carbon nanotubes. As it turns out, both of these reference materials or physical standards are not available for sale right now at NIST. And it's sort of an interesting story because just like Elizabeth was mentioning, nanomaterials have a, a lifetime and they have an aging process. And some of the measurement values that we originally did to release these reference materials weren't um, continuing to be valid over time. And so we pulled, particularly I'm talking about the single walled carbon nanotube one. Um, I know that gold will be back very soon. I'm uncertain about the single walled carbon nanotube one, but again, I'm happy to talk to anyone offline about that. So again, I wanna bring back this issue that you have to have a strong base in measurement science if you want to really do nanometrology. And then you can bring in your documentary standards and your physical standards and really up the game on doing your measurements. Okay, I know many of you have heard about standardization. And yes, it is an alphabet soup of, of different committees such as ISO and VAMAS and IEC, ASTM, and literally the BIPM as well. Many of you might not have heard of that. Um, and it, it can be overwhelming. As someone, so I joined the ANSI committee back in 2006. I'd already been at NIST almost 15 years, but I had never worked on standard, particularly documentary standards development. And it was really overwhelming. But I can tell you that working with the rest of the colleagues on the team um, gives you confidence and it's okay not to fully understand the process to still be involved in the process. So one of the things I really wanna take, I want you to take away today is that participating in standardization, the long-term process of developing standards is really important. Um, 
and again, there are many committees. There are different um, tags. So I'm so sorry. There are different um, tags, which is a technical group or a technical committee or subcommittee. All these acronyms, um, they aren't the point. And it, it can be overwhelming, but I want to get back. The point is the measurement science. And so keep that in mind uh, for nanometrology. Of course, I like to say help when I'm dealing with all of this too. And even after decades of this, it's still uh, a bit uh, challenging. So one point I want to make, and this is true within the ISO Committee 229, there is, is an entire working group focused on terminology. And I will tell you, when I first started, I didn't think, how could terminology matter this much? But what I you know, kind of got back to is here at NIST, of course, we care a lot about both accuracy and precision. And knowing that difference is, you know, very important to our work. As it turns out, terminology is really important to nanometrology. And I'll just put up um, this, this website is just a picture from a website. It's, it's from ISO. And it's called the Online Browsing Platform. What's amazing, and here's the link. All of the terms developed within um, our technical committee are available for free on this website. Um, this is just an example of um, nanoscale, nanoscience, nanotechnology. Back in the beginning, we argued for a long time, <laughs> I'll say there's still some arguments, about what length scale we were going to include in nanometrology. Would nano only be 1 to 100? Would it be 1 to 1,000 nanometers, etc.? As it turns out, the consensus, the international consensus, came to 1 to 100 nanometers. And so all the documents that you're going to see um, that have been developed within the committee are very relevant for that particular size range. Of course, most of us see it, feel in, in this work that it can't just be size. It has to be a unique property that is turned on or enhanced at that size range. And so that's just another kind of part of the work. But again, I want you all to be familiar with this website and feel free to use it because even in your publications, if you're using the terms that are ISO defined, you'll find more international um, adoption of your work. Another terminology piece I want to put up, because this is relevant to my work, is the definition of graphene. Um, I'll tell you, this story is, is interesting because most of us working in the field definitely define graphene as a single layer of carbon atoms. The Nobel Prize, uh, the discovery, and, and you know, we all kind of think about it like that. But when we develop this terminology of defining it that way, it affects industry. It affects US industry. And so we have to think about that, particularly from a NIST perspective. If we have companies that are selling product that they've labeled graphene, and it doesn't meet this definition, that will, of course, adversely affect them. But what we want to do, we want documentary standards to be based on science. That's really the key important piece. And so this is the true definition. And um, it was eventually adopted and people are, are dealing with that um, going forward. But um, so it's interesting things like this that, that come up um, and keep you sort of engaged in, in the, the crazy long process. Another example I'll put up is how we look at particles and aggregates and agglomerates. This was another um, interesting discussion. This particular graph that I'm showing you or, or figure is actually not from a terminology document, but from a measurement and characterization document. Um, how we characterize these particles using TEM, transmission electron microscopy. And you can imagine in that case, when you're looking at those uh, images, it is important to have a real definition of what we're going to call a primary particle or an aggregate or an agglomerate. So I just wanted to bring up that terminology, even as a measurement science lady, terminology matters. And we have to have global understanding and agreement on what these terms are to really move nanometrology forward. I just wanted to bring up, and Elizabeth had, had shown uh, a picture of this new U.S. government national standard strategy. <laughs> um, lots of words. But the important thing is I didn't want you to get to this document and be excited about nanometrology and see that nano is not specifically listed in this document. 
what is listed is what they're calling critical and emerging technologies. Well, here's the list of the critical and emerging technologies. And I put forward to you that most of them have nanotechnology as their foundation. So if you go and look at this document, remember nanometrology is a base part of it. And the work that we've done both in 229 and continue to do will enable semiconductors, quantum information, communication, biotech, et cetera. So um, again, here is the link to that document. It's important, lots of opportunity to get engaged if you are in academia or other government institutions or industry. We need everyone at the table to develop the best standards going forward. And it's really exciting being um, in this person who's worked on standards and not necessarily seen lots of excitement from outside of NIST about it. It's a great time because lots of people are interested in standards. So get involved. I wanted to get back a little bit. So how could nanometrology help you help any of us? Well, I put forward to you that nanometrology actually enables us to get the best value for research dollars. Now, we know most of our research is funded by the U.S. government, whether you're in academia or like I am at a government agency. And I'm guessing you, like me, have tried to reproduce a result in a publication and have not been successful, <laughs> maybe more than once. Um, as it turns out, nanometrology can help us both write publications and share our research in ways that enable reproducibility by someone else in another lab. And that is gonna give us better value for research dollars. I cannot tell you how many of us are, I hate to say wasting, but spending time trying to reproduce something where the information is just inadequate to actually do so. Nanometrology is gonna help us how to do a measurement with the details that are actually necessary to reproduce a result. Another advantage to actually having nanometrology is to hasten the pace of innovation. As I mentioned, we spend a lot of time trying to reproduce results, just as one example. If there's a solid base of nanometrology, things are gonna move faster. We're gonna be able to move, move things forward and actually have new discoveries that are, traceable, reproducible, precise, all of those important things. Another piece I really want to bring forward is it's going to enable scientific decisions on the safeness or efficacy of nano-enabled products. I bring this up because many, many years ago, and matter of fact, 15 years ago here, there was a meeting where many of us in the field gathered to talk about what could be the minimum physical and chemical parameters to characterize nanomaterials. Now, we wanted to do this because at that time, we were seeing a number of publications come out that were claiming um, a sizable amount of toxicity from nanomaterials. And as it turns out, many of those samples that were studied had other products in them that were toxic themselves, whether it was various metals or other, other molecules that were toxic. And so I hate to say it, but in a way, nano got a bad name in the beginning that it wasn't necessarily due to the nanomaterials themselves. And so one of the key things, again, this all gets back to better value for your research dollar and hastening the pace of innovation. If we fully understand the material under study, we won't make this mistake. We won't claim that something is toxic when in fact it was the solution that it was in or it was a contaminant from some other process. So um, I just put forward to you that the value of nanometrology is large. And again, we need everyone at the table working to advance these important details of being as careful and as detail oriented as, as we can. I would also say there are lots of other advantages. I'm just giving you a couple here. I wanted to give you an example of a VAMAS study. So Elizabeth mentioned VAMAS. This is one way that we undertake international round robins. Now, we work mainly with our NMI colleagues, the National Metrology Institutes around the world, but anyone can participate in VAMA studies. You don't have to be at an NMI or a fancy university, you can be anywhere. 
what's great is it's a it's a fantastic way to test a protocol. So a protocol is how to do a measurement. You know, it's a document, do this, do this, do this. And we're gonna test, one of the, the examples I'm giving here is we have a protocol and we're gonna send around the exact same sample to everyone. And we're gonna test how, if you follow the procedure, do we get the same results? If we get great results, we move that protocol forward as a documentary standard because it's validated. We have validated that if you follow the protocol as written, you're going to get a result that is both precise and accurate. And all your other colleagues can do that too. I put up two examples here. One was on graphene and one was on titanium. These two materials are nanomaterials well known in the community. One study we tested, again, these were two different protocols, of course, on two different materials. One of the protocols we found was inadequate and quite sizably so. What's great about these studies is we can determine the errors, the errors and where likely they come from in the measurement or in the protocol. And so in the first case where we were doing Raman spectroscopy, dear to my heart, I'm a Raman gal, um, of CVD grown graphene. And what we found out was often people are not calibrating their instrument over large uh, Raman shift distances, I'll call it. So in Raman, many of you know, there's a 2D peak and a G peak. Well, they are separated by over a thousand wave number shift. And if your instrument does not have a flat response over that large area, you can't take a ratio of the two peaks and get a meaningful number. So it, it was important to, to learn that sort of thing. In the other example, we have titania. And in this case, we found that Raman is very good at differentiating anatase and rutile. These are two different forms of titania often found. Again, titania is produced in mass uh, numbers. It's not always nanoscale, can be microscale. But Raman really proved to be a very sensitive technique if the protocol was followed well to differentiate the two polymorphs. So I'm just giving you two examples. Again, we have many of these under study. I'm giving you an example in VAMAS of a TWA, again, back to our alphabet soup, a technical working area. Now that is under Raman, but there are many of these technical working areas. There's um, graphene, there's different techniques. So anyway, feel free to, to look up VAMAS or reach out with any questions. I just want to put up here, because of this issue that we found in, um, in that particular graphene round robin, what we actually got was kind of a push from industry to characterize the graphene as grown. So most people, in research anyway, we take the graphene from the CVD uh, chemical vapor deposition, that's how it's grown, onto a copper substrate. We rip it off there and put it on silicon, silicon dioxide, because that is how we most of us make devices. Well, industry is saying we don't want to look at a transferred graphene sheet. We want to look at our graphene as grown on copper. And so now my team is working a lot on how to develop a protocol to characterize graphene on the copper itself. Now, that there are many issues with that, but we're actually working on that with many, many others, of course. And so um, keep an eye out. Again, we have to respond to what industry needs. If, if we have many growers in the U.S. and they want to sell their product right on the, the copper, they want a way to, um, to show that the graphene is, is there, it's single layer, and it's of high quality. And so we're working with them to do so. Just another example. I do want to put this up. So while we're talking about nanometrology, I want to put forward to you that nano objects, nanomaterials are now being used for metrology. Here within NIST, we have um, a dear colleague, Albert Ragosi, is has already developed graphene that it's grown on silicon carbide in this case. That's called epitaxial graphene. It is now the national standard for electrical resistance within the U.S. And that is really exciting because as you know, as we know, graphene isn't that old. And so what we've done is we've replaced an old material 
gallium arsenide, which was the standard for electrical resistance, with graphene. And there's so many advantages we're finding out. Not only are we getting better values for the resistance, meaning more stable, flat is really how we define that, sort of this value here, the flatness of um, the quantum Hall resistance, but we're also seeing possible applications in other areas. We can have different resistance values on the same chip. We can use a lower magnetic field we can use a higher temperature. All these things enable us to disseminate the standard more broadly. They lower the cost of people to incorporate it into their calibration standards. Also, we're gonna see, I think going forward, lots of other uses where we're going to bring in other quantum hall um, material systems. Um, anyway, I can't give away a lot there, but keep an eye out for new ways where we're going to leverage nanomaterials to disseminate metrology and particularly the S SI units. So from my takeaway today, I hope you see that participating in nanometrology and standards development is really important. We need all the experts that we can get because, of course, standards are only as good as the people who contribute to them. And this international diplomacy, the standards diplomacy, is a great skill set. If you want to develop that to add to your CV, it, it's a wonderful way um, to do that. And so lastly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to this webinar and caring about nanometrology. And I want to say, if you really care about nanometrology, working at NIST is the best. <laughs> so reach out to me either for, for anything about uh, doing nanometrology and working at NIST. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, thank you, Angie. Um, I think we all transition to Andras now. Yeah, I hope that I'm going to hit on the right uh, one. Do you see the full screen now? Um, no, do you want to do the switch swap displays? Okay. And then screen. Oops. Yes. Working? Um, I think you. It is not. Oh, so sorry. Um, do, do you see swap displays up on the top left? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. There you are. That's good. Okay, very good. The only thing I don't know how to turn on the camera now, but let me try it quickly so you can, can see me. Okay, it works. So yep. first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about one specific a workhorse in nanometrology, which is, is the scan electron microscope. So uh, we'll say just a few things about it that what I think are important here. One of them is the SEMs um, been always around and been able to do some kind of nano imaging. Um, in the 70s, late 70s, the resolution was about six nanometer or four with a better uh, electronometer and tremendous improvement uh, transpired. And now we have 0.4 nanometer, which is um, similar to some of the uh, uh, better high resolution transmission electron microscopes resolution that used to be uh, uh, a few years ago. And of course, there are physics reasons why the SEM resolution is lower than the TM, but still it allows for a sub 10 nanometer size object to be imaged and measured. These small objects are comprised of a few atoms, a few dozens of atoms, or the uncertainty that we need to uh, measure them is in that range. So it's truly atomic level measurements that we need to do here. This included uh, development of new methods uh, for signal acquisition, new detectors, standard artifacts, documentary standards, and all of those that have uh, been mentioned earlier are connected to the development and the advancement of SEM-based nanoscale 
uh, measurement. So the SEMs are very powerful, great for imaging, but they are not very good for accurate measurements. But we have ways of doing things better, and I will show you a couple of examples. So then the current instruments uh, can be inadequate uh, and need a significant improvement. I'm talking about the, one of the best top instruments that results here in the few slides we will see. There are lesser powerful SEMs, so it's important for the users, industry or scientific, to figure out what the instrument is capable of. But still, the situation is far from hopeless. <clears throat> Much better imaging and measurement uh, capabilities or, or methods are possible and they are being worked on. So they will show a few examples that where the things can be improved. Of course, um, uh, one of the things in the SEM is that you want the sample to be motionless at um, truly atomic levels, which is not trivial to do, but there are ways of uh, doing it. It's important that now when um, artificial intelligence or machine-based uh, methods become uh, possible to rethink that how SEMs can work and identify the physics limits of the SEM and try to eliminate the engineering limits as much as possible and, and feasible economically. I will show you some things. I would like to point out again, the rising needs uh, of the integrated circuit industry, hopefully will help again. So here is just an example of what SEMs can give you. These are 60 nanometer nanoparticles uh, mentioned earlier that the NIST RM8013, you can see the shape stackings and facets and, and things of those particles very well. Even at 10 nanometer size particles, what you see moving here on the, on the left side, is just I'm playing this particle in a digitally magnified form and you can see there is contrast. There are shape and intensity differences which are tied to the number of atoms. Again, this particle is made of a few hundred uh, atoms. SEMs can resolve uh, carbon nanotubes, multi-wall or single wall, can show very tiny particles, uh, say uh, gold nanoparticles in this case, but platinum particles in, in lithium batteries and, and other things. So it is possible to do a, a very good job, but it's important to keep the physics in mind, what information we are looking for. So you can see the same exact particle acquired simultaneously in one imaging mode on the left looks like this, it's called second electrons, and in transmission electrons look like that. So the information that you gain with one detector on one way of doing something in the SEM can be um, one way or another very important for the measurement. Here's an example that uh, from a few years ago, almost 10 now, uh, we succeeded in determining an integrated circuit line. This is called so-called fin fat. You can see this looks a little bit like a shark fin due to technological uh, reasons, but the measurement is critical in part. So is that how big these are, how tall these are, these lines, and whether they are touching each other or not, because that could lead to a complete failure of an integrated circuit that in nowadays could have billions, 50 billion and up uh, active devices all work. So if just one of them gets this portion here when the lines uh, touch, that could lead to a problem. This was based on putting physics to work, meaning we generated a library that the possible waveforms connected to the different uh, geometry of the structure were uh, modeled ahead. Uh, and then out of that library, which at that time took about 5,000 uh, CPU hours, and uh, now it, it can be done in a few hours, allowed us to, to figure out that exactly which one and fits a certain location. And you can see that the, the match can be very good. So these are actually showing you atoms. There's a little few atoms worth of 
difference in this particular case. And also the confidence in these results were established by uh, X-ray scatter measurements. How small objects we can measure. You can see here, this is a tilted uh, view to uh, show that how things could look like in the SEM if things are done well. This is a 2.1 to three nanometer. This is a four nanometer. So definitely sub 10 nanometer particles can be measured well. Here is something that you won't be able to see unless you have a pair of glasses like this, but this little thingy here is three nanometer. You can see it well, and you can see where it is located in this image scene. So it's the location and size measurement uh, can be done. So I would like to say a few words that how we do it. One is to get rid of the detrimental effect of drift. This is what you can see if you do fast images and just add them together. But if you use uh, two-dimensional Fourier, then you get much better quality images. You can compare this here. This was uh, uh, developed here at NIST by us and then later implemented in uh, any new SEM that you can find today. Another one is we realized very early that uh, uh, carbonaceous contamination is a critical part, a problem in SEMs. And in the past, it was something people couldn't really do anything with. But we developed methods to make sure that, yes, we can measure the sample, not the sample with some unknown amount of carbonaceous material. So these together led to much better performance of the SEM. So this SEM has a specification that the resolution is better than one nanometer. It can even be twice as good, which is obviously critical for nano measurements. You can see here that fine details on the surface of this tiny object. These are 50, 30, 60 nanometer ones. Another one is sample preparation for any kind of nano measurement is critical to do the sample preparation well. And one of the things that in the case, for example, in collodial gold, uh, the collodial material surrounds the particles, making the size determination less accurate or, or uh, easy. So we developed methods, electron irradiation actually turns out to be, can be very powerful. This, we can clean the particles without changing the particles, was just removing things. So these are some examples that over the years we developed and now it's, it's available, uh, plasma cleaning and also electron cleaning that uh, allows for much better quality nanoscale measurement truly few atoms worth of accuracy. We developed the uh, scale setting standards. Uh, these are um, uh, a new generation of them. A new version is becoming available soon, which will allow people to set the scale in any imaging method. The other one is, is by market as a future, even if we are working on it, is to use the physics, the signal generation, uh, physics of the signal generation to determine that what is the best way to measure something at the fastest way. So here is an object that we made up in a computer-aided design. And this, that object will look like this in secondary electron mode, in backscattered mode or transmission mode. And if we change the energy that we use uh, uh, for the electron beam, we can do better or less um, uh, accurate determination of the surface or, or the volume. What we also can do is, is uh, to compensate for the drift of the sample and the electron beam. You can, we can uh, develop laser interferometry technologies. And we can also do something that we don't need to acquire uh, the, a complete image, just we need to determine that where the particle is and do enough quick scans, not the traditional raster scan, to figure out that what exactly the information that we are interested in is, and then just in a sort of sparse adaptive beam scanning method, uh, we will figure out that how to do this measurement quickly. This is very important because the throughput is critical for all kinds of um, measurements. 
these instruments are expensive. So faster we get to results, the better the things will be. So it's just a quick summary. SEM is a workhorse for nanotechnology and scientific R&D and can measure nanoscale structures with, oops, something happened here. Uh, with some nanometer accuracy, we are talking about a few atoms worth of accuracy in, in, in many cases, can serve as a reference metrology for other shape and size volume measurements. In fact, we are working on a, a series of uh, standard references for a single particle ICPMS. And uh, the agreement can be very good. So this is also key that we have confidence in the results that we can generate with the SCM. So then the physics limits of the SCM are, uh, many of them are still far. So great improvements are possible. I listed some here. Anyone who's interested in details and talk about that, we would love to work uh, with you. And uh, again, we need to start from physics and the measurement and uh, for, uh, go for the engineering as uh, after that. So uh, we hope that the integrated circuits industry will help again many users. We work with them. And uh, the bottom line here, uh, the end of the talk is the future of the SEM is still bright. Thank you very much for your attention. And let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Andres. Um, again, I'd like to remind everybody, if you have a question answer, we're going to open up the uh, Q&A session now, and you can put your uh, question in the Q&A section of the chat. Um, and so we do have a question from Ivan Vidal. Um, does the nanotechnology used does a nanometrology used on Earth with protocols allow for leveraging and driving developments in microgravity or space nanotechnology, or do protocols need to be adapted to space conditions? Um, and I'll go ahead and answer this particular question. I think that all three of us touched on the, the fact that environment and um, understanding where your nanoparticle is and, and how you're measuring it um, are all very important. Um, and so I think that the opportunities to leverage the protocols and the measurement methods that we have um, currently um, could be applied to microgravity or space systems. But obviously, there will be new challenges that come uh, with moving the technology um, from Earth to space. And so there's also plenty of opportunities for um, developing new measurement protocols and really understanding um, what's different about that environment and then how it goes forward. Um, but the metrology approach stays the same. Um, understand what you're measuring, um, pin it to some good um, validation and um, uh, SI units and traceability and uh, it'll likely achieve good results. Um, Ivan also asked another question. I'll throw this to Andras and Angie. Um, how is AI contributing to nanometrology? Angie, you want to go first? I'll go second. <laughs> okay, so uh, AI is um, at the stage where um, years ago, uh, say, uh, code fusion was, which turned out to be not the case. I don't think the AI will be like that, but there's a big time hype and um, there's a lot of good work needs to go into it. But in my view, it's fascinating simply what uh, it could do or will do in the future. Um, uh, for the case of the SCM, we are working on evaluating it, what it can do. Uh, we found some of the these early results people tried to publish were, how to say, not up to the scientific rigor. But that doesn't mean that AI will not work. Essentially, think it this way, at least in my view, that there's a lot of things that you can teach a machine for. And if it's doing something, if nothing else, just find those areas that you want to do the measurement for you and speed up your measurement, then you are already golden. 
So there will be many other things that AI will bring us, but rigorous work is needed. And what we are also working on is to develop a sort of uh, expectations that yes, you can do and you can prove it, but we create uh, artificial images, which based on physics, which has 100% repeatability. So you can try your AI method, whether it is in per indeed performing well, or it's creating artifacts or even bogus results. So the future in that regard is also very bright. And I'll just quickly add, we've used it to help, I'm gonna call it sampling, meaning, so if we're doing a study as a function of temperature or of magnetic field, we've been able to input just a few data points and then use it to guide the next measurement um, temperature, let's just pick, that we would do. So it, I believe already it can help us um, in hastening our measurements that are necessary to get to the point that we are hoping, if that made any sense. And then just one other point on the space question, as it turns out, <clears throat> in Esten, particularly a group out in Boulder, where they are looking at um, time and the measurement of time, which uses these fountain clocks, they're able to see a difference in the thickness of a laser table in gravity's effect on these fountains. So they're actually measuring gravity at different heights on Earth and seeing its impact in their measurement, um, in the, the science that they're after. So um, I think just like Elizabeth was saying, almost everything affects nano measurements. And so they will definitely be impacted, many of them by gravity. And so um, taking that into consideration would be important. Okay. Uh, we don't see any few, further questions um, in the Q&A chat. So um, maybe I'll wrap up by saying uh, thanks again to Matthew Knorr, uh, Angie Heitwalker, and Andres Vladar. Um, oh, a question snuck in there. Um, uh, well, thank you everybody um, for your contributions. And we'll answer this last question um, from Megan Druhat. Are you all, all involved in the development for laboratory standards and analyzing air samples in comparison to occupational exposure limits such as lead or beryllium. Uh, does anyone? There are people at NIST who I believe are involved in that. Um, I, I am not and I don't think um, Elizabeth and Andras are. In that committee that we've talked a good bit about, ISO TC229, I know that in one of the working groups, they do look at exposure and the measurement of exposure of work people um, in a nano environment or in a nano rich environment. So um, I think that is a, a possibility of work, but not of elemental things per se, again, more in the nano world. Yeah. So some of the work that we um, uh, been engaged in is very relevant to, uh, you know, what kind of particles, the size, the shape, the material, the location on filters or otherwise surfaces and so on. So those, those um, can be evaluated uh, with those methods that we already worked out. But the key part is obviously what, what the goal is and how uh, rigorously the study needs to be uh, carried out. But um, if you are interested in a particular problem, just please contact us. We will get you in contact with those people who work in this field. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. We might be able to help uh, ourselves as well. OK. Um, and I think um, I think we'll wrap it up then in, in, uh, with respect to time. So I'll invite everybody uh, again, tune in on February 2nd for the second in the series on nanometrology for food, agriculture, and the environment. 
Um, and that will be presented again February 2nd. You can register at the nanometrology web series at nano.gov. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.